Good evening, and thank you for joining the UC Irvine Palmaraj School of Business Dean Speaker Series. This is also the first Bay Area Alumni Virtual Panels. My name is Teresa Wong, and I am the Alumni Ambassador for the San Francisco Bay Area. Our goal is to help create an engaged and valuable alumni network because we believe it is a lifelong benefit. Um, in the past, we've been more focused on social events. We had monthly happy hours, and our last event was a mixer with Berkeley Haas, which turned out great. But we're also always looking to expand our programs and uh, new ways to serve our alumni. So I am really delighted that we are able to put this panel together and uh, to have Dean Eric Spainberg join us tonight. I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight really quickly. James Binon, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Adult Service UCSF Medical, Cent Medical Center, also one of the COVID-19 incident commander. James completed both his bachelor's and MBA at UC Irvine, so he's what we call a double end eater. Dr. Pat Sober, um, Editor-in-Chief in Dr. Weisin, LinkedIn Top Voices in Healthcare and Chair of MedShare's Western Region Council. Prakash Gupta is um, our Healthcare Executive MBA and he's currently serving as a Founding Chief Revenue Officer and Attorney. We are so lucky to call these leader members of our Anteater community. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dean Spinberg. Dean. Thank you, Teresa. It's my pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you for your leadership as the Bay Area Alumni Ambassador and for making this happen, putting together this distinguished panel. We do have a lot to get to tonight. I, it, this is our third in a series of talks like this, so, uh, panels with alumni who are leaders in their respective uh, areas of, of professional areas, and many of whom are uh, on the front lines uh, as we are dealing with the COVID situation and and other uh, uh, kind of the related kinds of things that fall out of the COVID situation. So uh, if, uh, if you've got ideas and you're listening and you're an alumni and you've got ideas for future uh, talks like this, uh, we welcome uh, consideration of those things. So keep us posted and we'll keep these, keep these talks coming. But as I said, we do have a, a lot to get to tonight. And so without further ado, I think I want to jump right in uh, because that'll give us some time, I hope, at the end to perhaps get to some uh, listener questions. Each of you, thank you uh, on behalf of the Dean's office as well. Uh, uh, Teresa has thanked you on behalf of the alumni group, but uh, we're really privileged to have you and you, because you do play leadership roles in pretty different organizations. And I think our viewers would be curious to know how the scope of your day-to-day -day changed in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, what has been different, what has stayed the same, and what, is it, what does it look like for you on a, on a day to day or perhaps even hour to hour basis? And I think I'll start and ask James to, to address that and then uh, we can uh, glide into the other two uh, panelists as appropriate. Thanks, Eric. Um, it's so uh, things changed radically on the, uh, the night of Super Bowl Sunday. Um, we received our first two patients, uh, a couple from San Benito County uh, who were both infected. And that got us in the game really quick. We activated our command center. Uh, and for the last 100 days, I've been basically living, breathing, and eating uh, the COVID response. I think um, it's been, it, what I can't even imagine, I can't even think about the things that haven't changed because so much has changed in the last uh, 100 days. But what has stayed the same is our mission, our, our values as an organization and our true north goals uh, to be uh, the best provider of health care, the best employer uh, in the Bay Area. So those have kept us uh, straight. Would, uh, would either of, of our other panelists like to address how things have changed for you? Prakash, why don't you go ahead and let us and, uh, and James for kicking this off. Uh, I think the most important thing that has changed for us is uh, we used to have business conversations with our clients. We used to have straight talks with our investors and our employees. I think those conversations have changed to be more human conversation. Uh, it has been an all hands on deck approach uh, 
for the business world also, whether it's a startup or, or large companies who we call clients. Uh, in the human element has come in. Uh, what has not changed in the long run, of course, for any business uh, that is for profit is, uh, uh, you know, investors' expectations in the long run. But I think the human element has, has come in uh, over the last uh, two months, for sure. Back to you. Dr. Salber. So I have two hats. My Dr. Wei Zin hat, uh, my day-to-day -day life has not really changed that much because I run it out of what you see behind me. And I've been uh, working at home, um, both this and my consulting practice for many years, so I'm very comfortable with it. Um, and I have employees in all parts of the country and, and, and the world. Uh, but one of my other hats is that I work for a Med chair. I'm the uh, I'm on the board of directors, the board of trustees, and I chair the Western Region Council. And we were a very in-person meeting kind of an organization where we would actually all drive to San Francisco, even if it took us a couple hours, you know, commuting time, and have our meetings. Uh, so once the shutdown happened, and I live in Marin County, we we shut down in the San Francisco Bay Area really early. Um, we had to switch. Uh, and we uh, switched to Zoom meetings, which actually have turned out to be even more successful than our in-person meetings. We've had almost 100% attendance and very active participation. So my feeling is that uh, once the shutdown is over and uh, we go back to whatever the new normal is going to be, uh, we're going to keep on doing Zoom, Zoom meetings. I'm, I'm a big Zoom fan. I'm a, I'm a Zoom fan as well. It seems to have opened up a lot of avenues we didn't see before. Uh, you're uh, all in the Bay Area. What, um, you know, we're, we're down here in Orange County. For some of you, it's been a while since you lived here and, and, uh, and maybe even visited in some respects. So what, uh, what's lasting impact do you think COVID-19 will have on the economy up in Northern California? And do you, or do you think there are any challenges that are unique to that region relative to the rest of California or the rest of the nation? Well, Who would like to speak I, to that? I don't mind starting. Uh, I don't know the answer to this question, but we are, uh, you know, a, a big startup hub, uh, you know, from Silicon Valley, San Francisco, even in Marin, we have uh, a lot of startups. And I know from uh, myself and from my friends who consult with startups that a lot of them are struggling. They're either going to have to pivot really fast um, not knowing what their finances are going to be, uh, or they're going to be gone. So I think that that could be a, a pretty profound change for an area that's really thrived on our, our startup culture and our startup companies. Prakash? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I would like to, you know, remind that you know northern california is is a is a tech hub as as pat said there are a number of startups and and then we have this cluster of large organizations uh, apple google facebook uh, twitter salesforce uber many more uh, uh, and i think james will agree to this that some of these large employers were one of the first ones uh, to to let their employees start working from home in the first week and second week of March. They did not wait for the governor or for the federal government to, to give any, any kind of you know, uh, notifications or recommendations. I think that has, uh, that has helped. Uh, these large organizations are driving uh, what the economy will look like in the future. Most of these organizations, Twitter, for example, yesterday went ahead and uh, the CEO said that work from home forever. So they have, Twitter has gone ahead and told their employees that you can work from home for, for the rest of your, you know, working career with Twitter. Apple, Google, Facebook, everyone has announced, uh, uh, given the flexibility for employees to work from home till the end of the year. I think what's, what's happening is this is, this is, uh, uh, this is going to, drive uh, population density uh, a little more evenly through the region. Uh, uh, people are wanting to move to the suburbs a lot more. Uh, uh, rural parts of Northern California will see a uptick in terms of residents. Uh, I think tech is here to stay. 
tech will be much more virtual uh, and remote. Uh, and, and these large employers will play a significant role uh, in defining the future. So that's, that's my two cents, Dean. Back to you. James, how, uh, do you see uh, any changes in your realm uh, that are long yeah. lasting? Perhaps. Well, uh, so I'm also a resident of, of San Francisco, and you know, uh, the tourism and hospitality industries are such a large part of our economy. I'm really worried about the long-term impact of that, uh, as well as uh, the long-term impact of the work at home, uh, both uh, on the, the real estate in San Francisco. So. The real estate down Silicon Valley had gotten so expensive that many of the companies that were just mentioned had started moving back into the city, buying old office buildings, refurbishing them, driving up re uh, rents across the city. So um, I think there's going to be a definite dip there, uh, but that's going to create opportunity for the next wave of innovators to come in. Uh, so I do believe this, you know, this is a a creative, a group of very, a very uh, con concentration of very creative people that will fill that vacuum. It's going to take a little while to bounce back, but um, I'm, I'm confident that uh, given that, given the venture capital equity that's here, as well as um, our donor community, that you know, we'll, we'll be fine in the long run, but um, sort of reversing some trends that have been happening over the last half dozen years. So do you think that some, some of this effect will sort of perhaps free up uh, some of the congestion to make it more appealing in some respects for people? Um, yes, uh, coupled with an unfortunate uh, growth in our homeless problems, mm -hmm. things like this uh, disproportionately affect our vulnerable populations and are going to push people uh, who are marginally employed onto the street, I fear. And will that impact your organization specifically pretty heavily? Or Yes, I, I, am, I think that the overall health in the community is going to deteriorate. Uh, even though we're, we're pretty much back open for business, we're having a hard time convincing patients to come to the, the health care delivery system to receive care. And then uh, inevitably with the massive unemployment and job losses, our payer mix is going to deteriorate and we will see uh, more patients with Medi-Cal, less commercial insurance, and that's going to be an additional challenge for us. Well, actually, I know I, I actually was was going to come. I'll come back to that because I want to I want to get a little bit more detail as to what the patient flow looks like at UCSF. But let's kind of circle back around to that in a little bit. Sure. Um, one of the things I'd like to to ask all three of you is, you know, in, in any kind of a crisis, culture becomes increasingly important to uh, to an organization and whether it thrives or or otherwise, and how, and uh, Dr. Solver, you'd mentioned you jumped to, uh, jumped to the way uh, uh, you're meeting now and in, in, a, in a positive sense, but certainly there's other, there are other things that each of your organizations are looking at to promote a positive culture during this turbulence and this emotional time. And I just like, I think our listeners would like to hear what you're doing. So perhaps Dr. Solver, you could go ahead and expound and we can move on from to the others. You're muted. I think the biggest thing is that we have um, increased conversations. You can hear me now, right? And so we used to meet once a quarter and people would spend all this time getting to the meeting and then we'd hang out for a couple hours and talk about our stuff and then we wouldn't meet again for another quarter and people weren't really communicating in between. When we had this challenge and we had to give up our in-person meetings, we had to give up our in-person events that we used to do both at, at the headquarters in San Leandro and, and, and our fundraisers, I decided to have our, um, our meetings every week. So we started out having a 45 minute meeting every week. And what's happened is that people that maybe were 
quiet before in some of the meetings or they only called in. Now we can see them because we have created a culture where we say, if you come to the meeting, you have to have your video on. No, no hiding behind your picture, right? You have to have your video on. And we've all gotten to know each other. I know this sounds funny because we're not meeting in person, but I think that we've all gotten to know each other better than we were before with our in-person meetings. And, um, and it's given us an opportunity to really engage people more in, in the work because we're meeting more frequently, we're talking about more things, and we're looking at each other. There's nobody on the phone multitasking while they're coming to the meeting. Right, that's, that's, that's uh, no hiding if you've got the camera on, right? James, you said you've been eating, living, breathing the, the COVID crisis in one shape or form or another since it started. Um, how do you make sure you maintain a positive culture and not just get consumed by the seriousness of everything or do both at the same time, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, it's a delicate balance. Uh, but one of the things that we started doing early on was a regular routine communication out to the organization. So we started an 11 a.m. call every day for the entire management team, so about 400 people. Uh, and then twice a week, we had town halls for the entire UCSF community, where we would get two to 5,000 people, depending on what was happening. Uh, and we were very transparent about what was going on, both our challenges, and I remember having conversations. So we were basically producing five to seven hours of live TV on Zoom every week for a large audience. And we would have conversations like, you know, when we had our first death, and we've only had three, um, but should we acknowledge it? And we knew that there were 100 people in the audience who knew that that had happened. And that if we didn't acknowledge it, we would lose credibility. Uh, so we had to think about how to talk about that when our first, when healthcare workers started contracting COVID. How do we talk about that when there is no clear connection to where they got it? You know, it's in the community, it's in the hospital. We don't know where it came from. How do we find a way to talk about this in a way that's, that doesn't freak everyone out, um, but acknowledges what's really happening? And so we had a lot of those difficult conversations. I will just give one example of something that I think backfired a little. Uh, and Eric, you know this, the, uh, the UC Office of the President sent out a note saying that uh, no one was going to lose their job and, you know, guaranteed employment through June 30th which I think was a way for the Office of the President to try to give people some reassurance, but everybody's freaked out that the hammer's gonna fall right after the 4th of July. That's exactly, that's exactly the response I've heard from a number of people. They, they, they feel like, oh, that gives us a deadline, but, but in fact, it was tr trying to be reassuring, so that is a bit of a backfire. Prakash, I know that you are you're actually growing in the middle of this, right? Your firm is actually hiring. So uh, talk a little bit about what, you, what you're doing with regard to culture as you build in the middle of a crisis. So, you know, I always say this working for large corporations, uh, which I have done for two decades is, is like walking on a treadmill or maybe walking a little fast sometimes a few quarters. Uh, with a startup, it is like climbing stairs all the time. Uh, culture is extremely important in a startup when you are uh, uh, trying to, you know, run that fast and sprint that fast. So, for us, uh, some of the same some of the same measures that James and Pat uh, spoke about, uh, uh, we created uh, our business command center. Uh, uh, we did that in the first week of March. Uh, daily stand-ups uh, for the core team, uh, really looking at the business from a day-to-day -day standpoint, what's going to happen this week and this month. Uh, uh, empathy, bringing empathy in, in conversations uh, uh, with each and every employee in the organization. Uh, our clients uh, uh, are, are also living through uh, this uh, uh, they they want more flexibility in engagement of terms, uh, uh, and and I think we we decided that uh, all all rules and company policies and and commercial terms uh, I think in times like these uh, uh, 
are, are open for rediscussion with, with both internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. Accepting that uh, was the first step. And, and then working through that with all the stakeholders, you know, changing incentive plans for organizations, uh, uh, employees, so that uh, we are in sync with reality uh, and new terms with, with clients and investors. So, so it's, it's, it's a lot of empathy. It's a lot of communication, like Pat and James mentioned. Uh, uh, and, and we have been fortunate uh, that our business model uh, is very resilient in, 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 during these times. So, so we have continued to grow. We have, we have grown 25% uh, month over month through the last three months, uh, touch wood. That has its own challenges, even in normal times. Uh, uh, so, so empathy, communication, I think those are the key, uh, key aspects. So uh, I actually, I want to remind the uh, listeners and viewers that uh, we're collecting questions in the, in the chat box or, or in the Q&A box. So we'll put those in the queue. So if you have questions that are arising as our panelists are speaking now, we'll get to those in the order they come in toward the end of tonight's uh, discussion. I have a question here, I think for perhaps would be best kicked off by Dr. Silver and that is because of, of your um, editorial position and sort of probably the number of conversations you're having as well as your board position. Do you think there are any new practices that healthcare technology and business will keep in place post global pandemic? Much like you say, we like Zoom, but that's not really a healthcare technology, but other kinds of things. And then I think perhaps James, you might have something to say about this as well. Sure, I, I want to go big on this. I think healthcare, which has needed reform <laughs> for many, many years, is going to see change, permanent change in a lot of different ways because uh, healthcare has been impacted all the way from how we're delivering care to what's happening with finances of hospitals and physician groups and, um, and the medical supply chain. So I think we're going to see a lot of changes. But I, I think the, the one that um, is most exciting is what's happening with telehealth, which has been around for 20 years. This is not a new technology. It's been around for a long time, but it was impeded by a bunch of regulations like the need for physicians to be licensed in every state, which is just about impossible to do, and, um, and uh, unsophisticated reimbursement and um, technology wasn't as good as it could have been. And then also by just a, a lack of demand or interest on the part of uh, patients. And now that people can't or won't go to their outpatient visits, you're seeing a big uptick. I mean, if there's gonna be a winner in all of this on the healthcare side as a result of the pandemic, it's gonna be anybody who's involved in delivering um, uh, telehealth. And I think what's really exciting is that we're starting to develop a lot of technologies. For example, there's technologies now where I could send you, if you were my patient, I could send you a box of equipment that you had at home that would allow you to put a stethoscope on your heart that I could hear. I could send you, or I could tell you to get one of these, which is a six lead EKG that I can do at home, FDA approved, or this, <laughs> which is, a new type of stethoscope that not only does a single lead EKG, and you can hear the heart sounds, you can do the heart sounds, you can listen to the heart sounds on your iPhone, uh, but you could also see them. So there's all this exciting technology that's taking place. There's point of care testing. Um, uh, I just had, I was just pinged by um, somebody I did a story on a few years ago who did home sperm counts he developed a, a centrifuge where he could, you could spin down um, and, and do the home sperm counts. Now he's modified that and made it into a home centrifuge that can actually separate capillary blood into the cellular component and the plasma component. So I think you're gonna see a lot of innovation and I think outpatient medicine is gonna be changed forever as long as we don't mess up the reimbursement part of it. Because why on earth would you get in a car hit the traffic, look for parking, you're sick, you sit in a waiting room with a bunch of other sick people to see a doctor for 10 minutes to get a prescription for something that you knew you needed a prescription for anyway. It just makes no sense. But I think we're gonna see innovation, and James, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about this. I, I think we're gonna see it on the inpatient side as well. You know, people have been talking about hospital at home and 
ICU at home for ages. And, and this is gonna spur the kind of technology that's gonna allow us to get out of places that um, maybe are, are, are petri dishes for infection and get their care delivered uh, in areas that may be easier to keep safe. And then finally, I, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's become really clear that we have to do something about the way we take care of older people. People who, ha it is, have, we felt they weren't able to be safe at home, they weren't able to be taken care of at home, and we've put them into nursing homes, which we now realize are one of the most unsafe places to be in this pandemic. So um, that's just one small part of what's going on in healthcare. I think you're gonna, we have an opportunity to radically restructure and change healthcare for the good, and I really hope it happens. Eric, you're on mute. Oh, oh I said, by your comments, Dr. Salver, and uh, I guess, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I hope it isn't also the mother of unreasonable regulation once we come back out, right? So I suppose. Um, We've seen a remarkable reduction in regulation. If you look at what's happening with the, with the testing and, and the drugs and all the fast tracking, mm -hmm. I'm actually a little more worried that we're gonna throw regulation out because oh. regulation is part of what keeps us safe in healthcare. There's opportunities to make a lot of money and sometimes be a little less careful than you than you should be in certain Oh, okay. So that that's makes sense. my concern, but I'm, I'm, I'm the regulation person. There you go. James, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, just to double down on the, uh, the video visit. So, um, we were actually fairly, uh, we had maybe two and a half to 3% of our visits pre-COVID on video. Um, and we were among the academic medical centers, we were, we were pretty high. Uh, now we are at 58% uh, of all of our visits are video. 98% uh, or more of all of our mental health visits are video. Uh, and people are responding really well. Um, I do think there are many of the, the things that uh, Dr. Salber talked about in terms of uh, giving people pulse ox uh, machines to have to take home and tell you when they get to a certain amount, they got a call. We've got uh, just, just exponential growth in the, the patient hotline, uh, the, the amount of people that we're talking to uh, on a frequent basis uh, because we don't have the barrier of them coming in. It hasn't really changed that much on the inpatient side yet. Um, we are seeing uh, changes though in the way the care is delivered. Uh, all the pre every patient who comes in uh, is tested before they come in to ensure that uh, they, they are not shedding virus actively uh, while here or you know, if they need a transplant or something, we just have, we have appropriate precautions in place so we're not surprised. Can, James, can, James, can I interrupt just to ask one of the viewer questions is suggesting that people are, this is related to what you're talking about right now, viewers are afraid, to, that people are afraid to go to hospitals for uh, checkups. Do you see a trend where hospitals will be partitioned to treat only COVID patients and other and non-COVID patients in different areas or are you already doing that? What's the status of that kind of thinking? Um, you know, it's hard because people, uh, a lot of the data suggests that right, people are asymptomatic before they, they start, uh, or while they're still shedding. But uh, so one of the uh, relaxations in uh, regulation allowed us to reopen a dormant hospital. Uh, we have a, Mount, a community hospital, Mount Zion, uh, that's in the city that we closed for inpatient services uh, six years ago, but we were able to reopen it. It is uh, reopened with the understanding that it will be uh, where most of our respiratory patients, respiratory infection patients will be. Uh, but given where we're set, so today we just dipped under 10 adult patients for the first time in 45 days. Uh, so we don't have enough patients to fill it up. So now we've got you know, a third hospital that we're running uh, and I've got to figure out who else to get in there in a way that's safe. But we do have a, a COVID unit. We flipped one of our nursing units uh, to a negative pressure unit. 
Uh, we have uh, converted three clinics to respiratory screening clinics. We've got drive-through testing. So there is sort of a whole respiratory track, but it's not big enough to completely isolate. Partly because we avoid, you know, we flatten the curve. How, uh, so do you foresee, I mean, so you're telling us a little bit about what the patient flow looks like right now, but how do you see these nationwide or regional reopening procedures affecting patient volume? Is there going to be like this big latent demand back up and now it's going to flood in or what, what, what's the expectation? What are you guys projecting? Uh, we def so we uh, have canceled, delayed or rescheduled over 2,500 surgeries, 15,000 uh, imaging studies. And so we have a huge backlog. And one of the challenges we have is there's two. I mean, one challenge is convincing patients that it's safe to come back in. And I'd love to get Dr. Salver's comments on what she thinks about what might happen to uh, the overall morbidity and mortality in our community of non COVID diseases while people avoid the healthcare system. Um, but it's uh, also, we're one of those places that's been overflowing. We have 20 patients spend the night, pre COVID, 20 patients spend the night in hallways in the emergency room. Patients have to spend the night in the recovery room after surgery because the hospital is completely full. So pre COVID, we were often way over 100% occupied and we can't do that anymore. So we've got to figure out a way to titrate the demand. And for us, we've had kind of an affiliate network in name with Marin General, with Washington Township in Fremont, with John Muir, and many of those hospitals have excess capacity. And we've got to figure out a way to shift our lower acuity patients to our affiliates so we can take care of the patients that only we can take care of. Right, okay. Uh, you know, um, I want to shift gears just for a second here. I, um, well, actually I see Dr. Solver, you wanted to speak to that as well? Well, I, I wanted to speak to this issue of the pent up demand of right. okay. not, Go going, ahead. Uh, not, not getting care. And we know that that's the case. Um, and sometimes it's people who had been getting care on a regular basis. We, we just published a story by a couple of health policy physicians um, speculating um, and warning us that we need to be prepared for when people are no longer afraid or when they're underlying chronic illnesses start creating something that's so um, urgent that they do seek care that we could end up all of a sudden overwhelming the outpatient uh, uh, delivery uh, sector at a time when they've actually had to cut back because now there are a lot of uh, practices, you know, for example, my son's a radiologist and their income went down by 85% uh, last month. That's a lot, mainly because of the cutback of elective services. So you're seeing people get furloughed, you're seeing people in danger of closing their practices, you're, you're, you're seeing a lot of potential shrinkage of the delivery system in the outpatient setting at a time where we may be creating a demand that all of a sudden gets unleashed and overwhelms the outpatient sector. And this was a paper that called for us to at least put that, that on our radar screen and be prepared for how we can bring the capacity up rapidly. Right, right. So uh, actually you mentioned the doctor weighs in. Uh, what is the most do you hear from your readers? What's the most common question you've heard from your readers during this situation? Well, actually, I, I, I wanted to switch that around and talk a little bit about what I hear from our contributors, because we okay. have people pinging us all day long, uh, wanting to get stories in, in into the Dr. Ways Inn. And, um, and so obviously, since this has happened, we're getting a lot of stories about COVID, some like these two doctors that wrote this other story that I just told you about. But also a lot of people are pitching themselves as having expertise in, in COVID when you're kind of wondering why, you know, what are their credentials to even talk about it. And I think we should all be relieved to know that the search engines, which really drive what gets seen and what doesn't get seen, are very aware of the need to have expertise um, real expertise when somebody's writing about and talking about uh, COVID-19. So uh, we're seeing that. But I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of innovative things. I got pinged about a company that's created a new face mask, not for medical personnel, but 
for what he what they think will be a demand in the service sector right like waiters and instead of coming over your head like that it comes the mount is around the neck so you could move it out of the way and it's much more comfortable so we're seeing we're seeing that kind of thing come mm -hmm. through a lot of um, stories about innovation a lot of stories about mm -hmm. a doctor from stanford wrote us one about how to stay safe and sane in an age of covid um, so a lot of interest in that at the same time that we're trying to keep up our our regular stories because we know that at some point people get even though we're all glued to the tv around the politics and science of covid sometimes it gets a little much and you just want to read a story about exercise and, and well right right well actually and i'd like to actually I'd, I'd like to ask for kosh to weigh in a little with a little bit of practical dual advice for our viewers because uh, even, you know, most of us aren't sick or we don't think we're sick. As James suggested, we may be sick and we aren't showing the symptoms yet. But for the most part, most of us are kind of hiding from the disease or trying to avoid it or staying away. And, you know, um, but also uh, people need to continue to make a living. They need to, um, they need to, to, to find a job. Some of our students need to find jobs, our graduates rather. And um, what, you know, in summer, some people are being laid off. So what would your advice to job seekers be during this time? Are they steps they can be taking right now to position themselves for success during this pandemic? And then as we start to come out, and I'd be interested to hear from precaution and then either of the other panelists as well. No, Dean, that is uh, <clears throat> with the unemployment rate uh, high uh, uh, across the country. I think that's the most uh, important uh, uh, next step uh, uh, to bring the economy back. Uh, you know, one thing I would I would say is companies are more and more hiring individuals for who they are as 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 emotional beings as human beings, uh, and and less and less necessarily for their technical competency or functional competency. Those those are table stakes. So I think for all the job seekers out there, I, I would say that the, the importance of a cover letter, which speaks for who you are as individual and, and how you can be a team player uh, and, uh, and, and, and you know, your technical and functional skills are, are, are secondary because for, for us as a business, we continue to hire, we continue to hire you know, engineers and, and marketing and sales professionals. And, and we are doing all of that remotely without meeting them in person. And, and I think it is very clear for us, uh, given what we have gone in the last two months as a team, uh, we want to hire people who, uh, who will be first good additions as, as individuals, as emotionally sensitive people, uh, and, and second for their technical competency. So I think that's what I would say we are hiring for, and that is what I believe more and more companies will hire for. So, so being able to present yourself as to what you stand for, who you are as an individual is very important. Uh, I, I do have a comment on, uh, you know, a related comment on what, what uh, Dr. Salber mentioned, uh, you know, the example of uh, someone pivoting to, to do a, uh, almost a separation of blood cells and plasma, which is traditionally done by large companies like Tarumo and, and this person pivoting. So, so that's, that's the other thing everyone should understand, uh, job seekers especially should understand that businesses are also looking to pivot right now. So, so we as a business are also looking at new opportunities that are presented to us, business models or, or services that we earlier uh, did not think uh, 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 we would be asked upon to do. And I think when we are looking at pivoting our businesses, we are also looking at different kind of talent pool, people who have different experience. So, so make sure to all the job seekers, you, you do explain all of that. Uh, I, will, I will mention that, uh, you know, the Zoom CEO uh, in a very similar setting, uh, virtual setting, what mentioned that he was not prepared for, for the surge of demand. Zoom was not, not built for social or, or the kind of interactions that we are having. It was made for large Fortune 500 enterprises. And their whole team is pivoting with the security concerns around Zoom. How do they make it uh, 
viable for more social interactions. Similarly, every business is going through that pivot and job seekers should be in mind of that. Right, believe me, higher education is certainly going through similar kinds of of, uh, of changes. Dr. Solver, you don't want to speak Yeah, I just to wanted that. to talk about pivot too. I probably should have mentioned this when we talked about how things have impacted our businesses. MedShare, um, their business model for 20 years has been to collect healthcare supplies from hospitals uh, that are still good, but are no longer being needed. Maybe they're being upgraded. And we would take them to our warehouse. We had a thousand volunteers who would sort them, we'd barcode them, and then we'd uh, make them available for order to um, underserved hospitals and clinics in, uh, in underdeveloped countries. That was our business model, did it for 20 years. Once COVID hit, um, we had to pivot really fast because we had started working with safety net clinics, but all of a sudden, instead of us collecting supplies from hospitals and sending them overseas, we were collecting supplies from manufacturers and sending them to safety net clinics. We were um, going through all of the supplies that we had, looking for PPE through all of our warehouse and actually sending supplies to the hospitals who used to send supplies to us. So we made a huge pivot. Uh, and through it all, we formed new, really good, um, strong relationships that I think are going to serve the organization very well going forward. Well, I'd like to ask another viewer question, and I think it's it's interesting. I see uh, one of the first alumni that I met when I moved down here six years ago, Dean's Leadership Circle member, Lisa Locklear, asks, I'm interested in how the world of pharmaceutical sales reps particularly those that visit prescribers in long-term care facilities will change in the future. Most are doing in-service education meetings virtually now. I wonder if we will ever go back to face-to-face -to -face meetings. I think many of you have touched on some version of this. Do you have any thoughts? Who would like to address that? I, I think the face-to-face, -face, whether it's pharmaceutical or anything else, it's gonna take people a while before they feel comfortable. And just like we hear over and over if you're watching the news all the time like I do. Um, people aren't gonna be comfortable until they, we get it contained enough that we know that if there's a, a recurrence that we can be on top of it. And even then I think psychologically it's gonna take a while before people are, are gonna feel comfortable. I mean, going into a nursing home right now, you know. And I know I we have- Virtual for a while. Yeah, we have very restricted visitor policies uh, mandated by the local Department of Public Health, which apply here and in the nursing homes. And I think the nursing homes are even more sensitive uh, due to the fragile nature of the of the of the folks there. So, I do think that 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 business model is going to need to change, and there will be quite a while before. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not even right. You see the, in the news, like the family members are standing outside the window, you know, talking to their loved one in the nursing home. I mean, it's, you know, we're not the vendor reps in here that uh, you know, they're just, they're not here anymore. Unless they're running the perfusion machine. Prakash? <laughs> Two points. I think, I think we will go back to physical face-to-face -face meetings, I think 50% back. Uh, over the coming years. It will take time, as, as Dr. Salber said. It's not happening tomorrow or next week. Uh, but, but what will be game shifting is, you know, my 11-year-old twin boys and all the different teenagers and 20-something, they, they are going through virtual graduation parties right now. That generation and, and how they will live their life and lead their life. So, so the digital divide, I will be very different 10, 15, 20 years from now. Those, those folks will live more digital life uh, for good or bad. Uh, but uh, so there are two things, short term and long term. Right, right. Um, another viewer question, there has, there has been news recently about the ways COVID-19 could affect children. Some private schools in Orange County will open next week with extraordinary precautions. Can parents feel safe sending their kids back to school, especially in light of the Cal State University system going online for the entire 2021 academic year? I don't know that they are for the entire 2021 academic year. I know they are for sure for the fall, but I'm not sure beyond that. But anyway, the question stands, what are people looking at uh, with regard to sending their children back to school? 
I'd like to jump in with a personal experience, if it's okay. I have um, granddaughters in middle school and high school, Iowa and Idaho, and they have been at home for the last six weeks. Initially, there was no, no plan to do. They didn't have the online learning. It took a while for that to kick in. But um, uh, we did grandparents hour every day <laughs> talking to them. And over the course of this last six weeks, they have organized their lives on their own, figured out how to get the learning that they need, how to get everything done, how to include workouts, how to have more family time. And one of our last calls, they said, why would I go back to school? I mean, I think we may need to have a, a rethinking of how we're educating kids. Because one way to make them safer is not to have them in classrooms. Now, private school could do that, but not to have them in classrooms with, you know, with 30, 35 kids, right? With no space in between. Uh, one way you could do that is, is say, okay, you only have to come to school for two or three hours so you can have that in-person socializing with, you know, the, the benefit of that. But we'll do the rest of the education um, through a combination of, um, of self-directed study and and online. I mean, I, I really hope the education system does like the healthcare system needs to do and ask some hard questions about how things should be different going forward. Actually, Dr. Salber, your, your answer to that question leads right into this other question. It's it, a viewer question. It says, in San Francisco, of course, it's advanced with regard to technology, but what about areas that don't have internet access for telemed or gadgets at home? Schools have had to deal with people who don't have Zoom or internet. Uh, and, and this is related to what you were talking about with regard to the future of healthcare. How do you see healthcare handling this uh, in the future? James, do you want to, did you want to speak to that? I guess I, I would just, uh, you know, while this is a tech savvy place, uh, there are certainly pockets of San Francisco where people struggle. Uh, and I know the San Francisco public school system has actually rolled out a, a iPad distribution uh, system so that the kids in San Francisco, I've got a high school freshman and a college freshman. Uh, and so they're uh, doing whatever they can to uh, get the kids connected, even uh, sponsoring. They've got like Mark Zuckerberg's underwriting all this, but sponsoring uh, getting internet into people's houses in the Bayview, Hunters Point and some of those neighborhoods. Uh, but I think it's gonna continue with uh, healthcare in the video visits as well. Um, I think that is going to, I think, I think that this has exposed, uh, so, real problems with the safety net hospitals. I really were, I mean, we're struggling financially, but I really worry about some of the, uh, the areas that were on the brink already. And how are we gonna deliver care so that people don't have to come here from the northernmost counties of California? What do you think, uh, I mean, I sort of extending that thought to the earlier question, and, and Dr. Salber's thoughts, what do you think it will take before people should feel like they can send their kids back to a public environment if, if it's only three hours a day or two hours a day? I mean, what, I don't know, uh, you know, I mean, because this sounds like it could be one of those have and have not kinds of situations that's, that's setting up, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I have a little distorted perspective because I've been walking into a hospital every day for the last hundred days and being around a bunch of people. So I have not been isolating. Fair enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm ready for my kids to go back, not because we're not getting along and things aren't good, but um, I think they need that social interaction. I worry about us all just becoming digital, uh, having a digital interface and not the real human connection. I think with, with testing, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a vaccine, uh, but I think with testing and screening procedures, maybe splitting the classes into mornings and in, in evening and afternoons, uh, that uh, that that might be able to happen. But I just saw the Wisconsin Supreme Court just lifted the whole order, so maybe my daughter can go back to the University of Wisconsin in the fall. <laughs> you can certainly go to a bar now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have uh, an, uh, another audience question here. Um, in your respective industries, what uh, retrenchment strategies are being explored to protect the sort of the, the core of your business given the longer economic slowdown? I mean, that's actually kind of related to the idea of things opening up either quickly or slowly. 
Do you want to speak to that, uh, Prakash? Do you want to speak to that? You're growing, but what happens if you stop growing? What if we, you know, are <laughs> yeah, so, or other businesses perhaps? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the first order of the order of the day uh, back in February, March was to ensure that uh, uh, your cost structure is, is such that uh, uh, it's accounting for the worst case scenario and you have enough uh, cash to survive for two years. So that's the runway we are thinking and most technology companies, uh, startups uh, are, are keeping as a baseline. Uh, uh, this is, okay. this is, this is, and, and, and you know, the idea is that, you know, pivot, I mean, constantly look for an opportunity to, to pivot uh, there, there are new business models, as Pat mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's that's my take. Uh, okay. You know, we're we're we're. I don't want to run out of time before we run out of questions, and we're getting a lot of questions. So I'm going to kind of combine two of these because a, a couple of you have spoken about senior housing and and help, working with the elderly. Um, two questions here combined. I'm going to do my best uh, from viewers. Interestingly, my friends find that. The younger generation has adopted telemedicine. This is, I know this is a medical doctor who's asking this, also one of our alumni leaders. However, the at-risk elderly population is still coming to the physician offices. How do we get that at-risk population to accept telemedicine? And then I'll combine that with a question that says, how will senior housing look in the future or work? In, how do you foresee it working senior medicine and senior housing in the future? And I'll go ahead and, and let James, you're on, on mute. Why don't you speak? Yeah, well, I, you know, I can't get my mom on Zoom and she's, you know, she's in Tucson, so I can't even just go over and set it up for her. So I do worry about the barriers. I think that is a big opportunity uh, for innovation and disruption. You see like the you know, the little, I can't remember the name of the Facebook little tab thing now that's sort of plug and play and helps. But I think we need to uh, find a way to get to the, to the, uh, the elderly. Um, and I don't feel I don't feel competent to answer the senior housing <laughs> portion of the question. Well, I, I, I'm wondering if we could, you know, if you had if you had somebody in Tucson who could go to your mom's house and sit with her and, and until she got really comfortable with doing the video visits. Um, yeah. I bet she would get there. The problem is we don't have that. And she I think, won't open the front door. <laughs> well, I think we may end up with a whole new, just like we, we've done once we started doing population health management and care management. We had, we've ended up with all these new people who provide services in, in healthcare. And it may be that we end up having, you know, telemedicine specialists and their specialists, you know, with a geriatric tra training who go and help get people online uh, i mean that would be one thing that you could think about doing i don't have the answer for the for the for the senior housing either it just seems to me that we've we've made a really good case that the way we're taking care of um elderly who are not independent anymore is a really bad way of doing it um you know given what's happened with the with the pandemic i don't know what the answer to that is it may be some um, some new form of housing where people aren't all so close together. And maybe when we actually pay the people who take care of them a living wage. Yes, Prakash. Uh, I just want to add, uh, you know, this is an excellent pivot business opportunity for a Zoom or a Best Buy. You know, Best Buy has a tech army which helps you and sets up computers in your home. Uh, or, or Zoom can have uh, that. And so, so this is exactly what, what I was mentioning. You know, these are, there are pivot opportunities to do businesses uh, and, and, and good to hear James, uh, uh, you know, some things are universal. Your mom is in Tucson, you're not able to uh, get her on Zoom. My parents are in Mumbai, same. So some challenges remain the same across countries. Yeah. So uh, let me ask this question. Um, a viewer question, if medication or vaccines are approved, and I know none of us have a crystal ball, but you are, a couple of you anyway, are on the front lines of this kind of thinking. If medication or vaccines are approved by FDA, what would be the time frame for their availability to the public? And we hear a lot of things on TV and read it in the news, but what's your expert opinion? Well, I trained um, 
my pandemic was was HIV. I trained at UCSF when HIV started, um, and we still don't have a vaccine. So it's really unpredictable what time we will get it. Um, we've, been, we've been told that it could be 12 to 18 months. Um, that most people say would be a, a really fast to get to a vaccine. On the other hand, we have 100 candidates already now, vaccine candidates, and lots of money is going into it. And people are working really fast, so we, we might be pleasantly sur surprised. But I think we're probably not going to be able to wait until we have a vaccine or a curative medication um, before people figure out how to incorporate social change in their day-to-day -day life that makes them feel safe. Okay, thank you. I think the other thing is just the practicality of delivering the vaccine. Um, you know, we have a hard time getting everybody to get a flu shot, um, but uh, if we need to vaccinate 40 million Californians and God knows how many others, you, you, you've heard all the stories about the PPE, right? We don't have enough test kits, we don't have enough reagents, we don't have enough swabs, we don't have enough masks. I mean, like how many syringes, how many needles, uh, where is all of this going to come from? So I do think another, another opportunity could be, is, in my opinion, likely to be uh, bringing some of the the manufacturing that's been offshore back onshore so that we have a domestic supply of many of these basic things. I mean, who knew that all PPE for its all intents and purposes was actually made in China. Um, and so our entire supply chain just dried up. We couldn't get anything uh, resupplied. So it was, you know, I think we're, uh, th there's an opportunity there in some old bricks and mortar kind of businesses. One uh, one last question here, uh, and then we're, I want to give you each a, a minute to, to speak uh, uh, about something special to your heart. Given the high rate of unemployment, what would you recommend a young graduate of the Mirage School focus on right now in order to find meaningful work and make the biggest impact in the age of COVID? One thing you could, could do is have a... Uh, a specialty in, in learning how to fix the medical supply chain. <laughs> Obviously, a huge hole um, mm -hmm. in, in the whole healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Prakash? I think uh, being an educational institution, I think uh, leading the way uh, in, in, in pivoting into new ways of delivering education uh, would be would be wonderful, and of course, with the healthcare and the in the medical establishments, uh, also pivoting into telemedicine, leading the way uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. programs around that. James, your thoughts? Uh, I would, as I would say, in any day and age, uh, follow your passion, be true to what you care about. I think Prakash is exactly right on the hiring and looking for people, uh, you're looking to find people that don't just have a resume, but that you've, you've picked something up uh, about their passion in the interview process and any of these disruptive type things that we've talked about. And I, but I would also say, find something that's core. Um, I think men, this has taught many of us that many of the things that we used to find valuable are not quite as valuable as we thought. Well, you know, I, uh, I really, uh, one of my, this is really a pleasure for me to be able to speak with uh, leaders among our alumni population. And one of the things that we hold great pride in or take great pride in is that uh, our leaders have causes that are near and dear to their heart that they are pushing and that they're pushing for because they're pushing for uh, development, something beyond themselves and beyond uh, beyond just uh, what's in front of us. And, and so with that, I want to ask each of you to take about 30 seconds and, uh, and talk about uh, the cause that you're championing at this point in time. And I will ask uh, James, why don't, you're off of mute. Why don't you go ahead and take the first stab at this, please? Okay. I mentioned earlier the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 is having on our most vulnerable populations. And a, 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 a horrible example is unfolding now in the Navajo Nation, which has an infection rate per capita rivaling that of New York City. Uh, but unlike New York City, uh, they have archaic medical facilities, high risk of, or high incidence of risk factors in the population, 
and an unbelievable 40% uh, of the houses don't even have running water. So I am uh, supporting and encourage all of you to take a look at what's going on in the Navajo Nation and investigate the Navajo Nation COVID-19 relief fund. We sent 21 nurses and physicians and the stories that they're sending back are heartbreaking. Thank you. Thank you. Prakash. So, uh, you know, the business I, I, I belong to, we are a, we are a talent marketplace, uh, which means our core value proposition is to, to find jobs for deserving candidates. Uh, and I think that's the mission uh, that we are growing uh, and continuing to do. Uh, we are hiring ourselves and, uh, and we are helping thousands and thousands of uh, professionals find the right job and match them. We have created a body of knowledge uh, as to how organizations can grow uh, effectively remotely and scale. So any help that we can provide to any of the alumni is uh, happy to help. Thank you very much. And Dr. Solver? Sure. Well, I talked about MedShare and what it does. Um, and I think one way to think about it is we're, we're, we're kind of like the Red Cross for the medical supply chain. Um, so I would like to ask people to support the work we do. You can go to medshare.org and learn more about us. And while you're there, you can press on the donate button and make a little donation. And James, we should talk offline because we support safety net clinics. We haven't supported anything like the Navajo Nation, but I bet there's a big need for medical supplies there. So I'd love to connect with you. Well, I want to thank you all, Dr. Solver, Prakash Gupta, James been on. Did I get it right? Yep, close. Yep, okay. <laughs> uh, these are really so fulfilling because so often we think as business educators that we're not making as big a difference as we need to be, but this convinces us that we can make a difference as business educators because we are making a difference in the lives of those that are on the front lines. These are so informative. They're helpful. Uh, your causes are, are causes that are, are, are things that are worthy of support. And I wanted to tell you that I know from past experience that these will, this, this will be pushed out. We had about 100 people listening live tonight, but it goes out to literally thousands of people within 24 hours. And we get a lot of positive feedback. So I want to encourage all of our listeners and those who are viewing it uh, uh, after the fact to uh, to look into um, the causes that are near and dear to the hearts of our of our panelists. And again, thank you, Teresa, as the ambassador who put this together. I really appreciate it. And any of you who have any uh, any ideas for future events like this, the Dean's Suite Speaker Series Zoom version is uh, is open to your suggestions. So have a great evening. Thank you again to all of our panelists and Teresa. Good night. Thank you.